Its leaders hope to use the war unfolding in Israel to boost their power in the Middle East whilst shielding themselves from retaliation behind a network of puppet proxy groups. Iran and its ruling mullahs are not directly involved in the crisis rapidly engulfing Israel, but they will be central to deciding what happens next. That's because they control or support at least a dozen terror groups which hem the country in from the south, north and east. That includes Hamas, which carried out the October 7th massacres in Israel. Built over decades by the Quds Force, the overseas arm of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the so-called Axis of Resistance was orchestrated by General Qasem Soleimani until his death in a US airstrike in 2020. At its heart is Hezbollah, the world's best-funded and best-equipped terror group, but other proxies have also fought against US troops in Iraq, helped keep Bashar al-Assad in power in Syria, and fuel a civil war that is still raging in Yemen. Closer to home, the IRGC has sabotaged and seized Western oil tankers in the Strait of Hormuz, interrupting global energy supplies. As Tel Aviv moves troops into Gaza to wipe out Hamas, the fear is that Hezbollah could open up a second front in the north, stretching Israel's forces dangerously thin. That could draw in the US and its Western allies, plunging the region into another long, bloody and destructive conflict with no end in sight. Already, America has unleashed airstrikes against Iranian bases in Syria as a warning to stay out of the conflict. With Israel and America occupied, Tehran would be free to expand its influence and supercharge its weapons programs, including its mission to develop a nuclear bomb. This is why the clerics in Iran may decide to push the Middle East into a war that could reshape not just the region, but the world. To understand Iran's motives, we need to go back to 1979, the year the Islamic Revolution transformed the country from a monarchy allied to the West to a theocracy hell-bent on destroying it. The man the revolutionaries deposed was US-backed Mohammad Reza Shah, a liberal and a modernizer who believed in making Iran into a Western-style nation-state, but who nevertheless wanted to maintain his own absolute power. Allied against him, was a loose grouping of Western-educated liberals who wanted a say in running the country, Marxists and socialists abhorred by the Shah's immense wealth and lavish lifestyle, and traditionalist clerics who feared losing power. That last group was led from exile by the revolutionary cleric Ruhollah Khomeini. Khomeini was everything the Shah was not, an ascetic who lived a sparse life and advocated the establishment of a state based on his own warped interpretation of Shia Islam, which he believed should one day rule the world. When the revolution began in 1978, opponents of the Shah united to oust him, which they did by February the following year, bringing to an end two and a half thousand years of monarchical rule. With the Shah gone, there were hopes that Iran would embrace democracy and rule of law, and Khomeini, who had tricked some in the West into believing he would deliver this, was allowed to leave exile in France and return home. But those illusions were quickly shattered as he began using gangs of hardline religious goons who would go on to become the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps to eliminate his rivals. First, he targeted the liberals and anyone with links to the West, culminating in the Iran hostage crisis in which 52 American diplomats and citizens were held for 444 days before escaping with the help of the CIA. He then began cracking down on the socialists, tens of thousands of whom were rounded up, thrown in jail, tortured, and many years later, executed en masse in a purge partly overseen by the now president, Ibrahim Raisi. Khomeini then cemented his grip on Iran with the passing of a new constitution which established him as its supreme leader and committed the country to spreading his Islamic revolution globally. He identified the two main targets of this revolution as the United States, which he branded the foremost enemy of Islam and the great Satan, and Israel, 
which he viewed as a US proxy in the Middle East and referred to as a cancerous tumor. Both countries, he told his followers, should be destroyed. Iran's first chance to put his words into action came just a few years later, in 1982, when Israel invaded Lebanon, which was then in the midst of a long and bloody civil war. Aiming to drive Palestinian militants away from its northern border, Tel Aviv's troops ended up occupying much of the southern part of the country and were soon joined by thousands of American soldiers deployed as part of a peacekeeping mission. Tehran seized the opportunity to strike its two biggest foes at the same time by establishing a militant group in the region that would become known as Hezbollah. Given weapons, money, and training by the Quds Force, the Revolutionary Guard's overseas arm, Hezbollah led a campaign of terror against Israeli and Western forces. Deploying suicide bombers for the very first time, the group carried out a double attack in 1983 that blew up almost 60 French soldiers in their barracks and almost 250 US Marines in what remains the single largest terror attack ever carried out against American military personnel. In the wake of that attack, Israel agreed to withdraw from most of Lebanon and the US brought its men home in what was viewed as a major victory for the jihadists. That convinced Tehran to double down, turning Hezbollah into the world's best armed and best funded terror group, which is now thought to possess upwards of 130,000 missiles and receive more than 700 million in funding each year. Iran also sought to export that model across the Middle East and over the next several decades spent tens of billions of dollars establishing proxy groups that are together known as the Axis of Resistance. Through the Quds Force, Iran is thought to have funded, armed and trained at least a dozen militias in seven nations. These include Lebanon, Iraq, Yemen, Syria, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan, along with groups such as Hamas in the Palestinian territories. Aside from terror attacks in Lebanon, this network has been used to wage war on coalition forces in Iraq, fought to keep Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad in power, and fueled a civil war in Yemen that rages to this day. It may have helped carry out a devastating attack on Saudi oil fields in 2019, and several suspected officers were arrested in Germany in 2020, accused of spying on Israeli targets. Meanwhile, the Revolutionary Guards have menaced the West closer to home, masterminding seizures and strikes on oil tankers in the Strait of Hormuz. Attempts to break up this axis have been piecemeal. Iran was designated a state sponsor of terrorism by Ronald Reagan in 1985, and in the 1990s, Bill Clinton and his allies began sanctioning members of its proxy network. But perhaps the heaviest single blow was dealt by President Trump in 2020, when he authorized the airstrike that killed General Qasem Soleimani in Iraq. Soleimani was then the leader of the Quds Force, and perhaps the one and only man who knew the true extent of its proxy network and how to coordinate it effectively. Trump gave the order amid fears Soleimani was in Iraq to orchestrate a major attack on US forces, which never materialized. Iran carried out a rocket strike on US bases as an immediate response, but then largely fell quiet as Soleimani's death badly hurt its capabilities across the region. However, there are now fears this network of terror could be preparing to launch a major regional war. It began on October the 7th with the Hamas attack on Israel, the worst terrorist atrocity in the country's history, which saw 1,400 people killed, most of them civilians. In the immediate aftermath, Hezbollah, a close ally of Hamas, began launching rockets across Israel's northern border and firing at Israeli troops, prompting Israel to fire back. Fighting then spread to Syria, with Israel accused of bombing the airports in Damascus and Aleppo in order to stop Iran moving weapons through them and towards the Golan Heights, a contested region on Israel's eastern border. 
Drones and rockets were also used to target US forces in the country and in neighboring Iraq, with Iranian proxies thought to be the culprits. America has since unleashed airstrikes on several Iranian bases in Syria in retaliation, warning Tehran to stay out of the war. And Yemen was then dragged in as a US warship shot down several rockets being fired at Israel by Houthi rebels who are backed by Iran. Iran itself has since warned that anything is possible and that the region could go out of control unless Israel stops what Tehran calls a genocide in Gaza. Expert opinion is divided over what exactly could happen now. Some argue Hamas's attack caught Iran and its proxies off guard and they are now scrambling to show support whilst at the same time steering clear of a wider war. But others fear the atrocity was merely the opening gambit in an operation intended to engulf the whole Middle East in conflict. As Israel begins its ground campaign into Gaza to wipe out Hamas, all eyes will turn to the likes of Hezbollah to see their reaction. If those proxy groups, or Tehran itself, decide they cannot sit idly by and watch, it could escalate into an all-out attack on Israel, which in turn could drag in the US. Tying up America and Israel in a bloody war, Tehran would then be free to expand its influence in the region even further. And it could also seek to race ahead with the program to develop a nuclear bomb, which for decades has been thwarted by US and Israeli security forces. Should that happen, it would have huge ramifications, not just for the security of Israel itself, but for the whole of the Middle East and for the wider world as well.